time when uh, teams all over the country in the top 10 are falling. Florida doesn't look that impressive, but they survive in advance, and that's the most important thing at this point of the season. The Gators wrap up the SEC campaign with a 27-17 win over South Carolina. We bring in David Waters from Gator Sports Radio to help us break it down. David, a noon kickoff there in uh, Gainesville, and uh, the Gators shot out to a to a nice, comfortable lead, kind of coasted home from there. And considering how well South Carolina has played against some decent competition in recent weeks, Texas A&M, Tennessee, a pretty nice effort, especially in the first half. Right, and uh, they, they kind of came out firing a little bit better. You know, it was nice to see, you know, a little bit of, um, you know, breathing room going into halftime of um, after the Vanderbilt debacle last week. You know, Treon Harris, you know, made some good throws, made some bad throws. Um, running game really got going, really helped him, especially late. Um, Harris got away with, you know, some plays he probably shouldn't have, but it was the defense again, who, you know, definitely the first half, third quarter as well. That really, really, really carried this team. You know, how far can they carry this team is, just, I guess, going to be the question from here on out. But uh, you got, you know, that, that defense, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, we knew it going into this year was going to be the key for Florida. And like you said, it's pretty much the workman like approach. McElwain knows he can lean on that defense. That's what he's going to do. He doesn't take a lot of chances. And, you know, Treon's still learning the system for him. No need to take a lot of chances. Uh, pretty much, you know, knew if Florida played their game, they were going to beat South Carolina. So and that's pretty much what happened. You know, let them come back at the end. But, you know, Florida walked out of Williams Brass with a win. David, you watch everybody across the country and especially concentrated there in the SEC. Where would you rank this defense? Uh, the way Alabama's played, you'd have to make them the gold standard. But uh, LSU obviously brings some good defense, although Arkansas hit them up for 31 yesterday. Got some other fine defenses. Ole Miss comes to mind as well. Uh, it, your thoughts about Florida's defense? I, you know, if I had to rank them, yes, behind Alabama, Alabama's probably just been more consistent. You know, Florida's best versus Alabama's best, I think, are pretty even. But as far as consistency goes, I'd probably, you know, probably put Bama up in there. But, you know, Florida's really, I mean, if you really count it, only really had that one bad quarter versus LSU, that second quarter where LSU kind of piled their points up and was enough to win, you know, win that game. But besides that quarter, you know, this Florida defense has been, you know, lights out. And, and it's kind of funny, you know, I was reading some people, you know, kind of where to compare – and a lot of people were kind of comparing it to the 2012 defense to, from uh, under Will Muschamp with Sharif Floyd and Dominic Easley, Josh Evans, Matt Elam, uh, John Bostic, those guys. And, you know, kind, kind of comparing, you know, that may have had more star power, but consist, consistent-wise, you know, this defense is right up there with that one. I probably couldn't pick out of those two. But, uh, you know, right now, you know, they have a you know legit pass rusher, Alex McAllister, who was injured yesterday, but everything seems to be fine. Um the linebackers really play good. You know, Antonio Morris and Jared Davis, those guys are in the backfield a lot and make a lot of tackles. But this is secondary still. It's probably with the best in the nation with Vernon Hargraves, Jalen Tabor, Quincy Wilson, who sealed the game yesterday with an interception, Count O'Neill, and, I mean, Marcus May. And some of those guys come up and lay hits like linebackers. So, you know, overall, yeah, this defense is, is what McElwain counts on. He knew it coming in. Jeff Collins walked into a great situation for Mississippi State. And, uh, you know, he's probably helped his resume for an, well, all these jobs that are open. He may get a look from all this talent that he's got in Gainesville. That uh, 2012 team, unfortunately, kind of gets lost because they didn't win the East and then they lost the Sugar Bowl and ended on a kind of a sour note. But, wow, dominant defense in, in a league at that point when there were, even more so than right now, great quarterbacks, elite wide receivers, man, shut down Johnny Manziel and company, Mike Evans, shut down Zach Mettenberger and Jeremy Hill, I think to six points. On and on, even the Georgia loss, uh, as you well know, that was a turnover fest for the Gators. Otherwise, the defense just really took it to uh, Aaron Murray. That was a great defense uh, in 2012. I thought it was the best defense in the country. All right, uh, you, you made some interesting points last week, David, about Treon Harris's development and the play calling to try to help him, also the play calling to try to protect him. So here's a kid who has dual threat ability. So you would think... Uh, designing runs for him would be part of the game plan but they don't want him to get hurt also it's kind of a strange anomaly with some of these uh, dual threat quarterbacks is that they throw better from the pocket so they threaten the defense better when they break containment but because their mechanics aren't great they don't throw well on the run they're kind of erratic and they they actually throw better from the pocket so just your thoughts about uh the approach 
yesterday against South Carolina, what you would like to see, obviously, with Florida Atlantic coming up. This is a game in which they can try some things, work on some things, and, and probably have some breathing room. Right, and I'll go ahead and mention mechanics, and she started there too. When Treon Harris can sit back there and he gets the pocket, when he can really launch off that back foot, he really makes some good throws. I mean, but the problem going along with that is, is he making the right read? And that's where he got in trouble with yesterday. You know, he, he did get lucky on the Cronkite touchdown where he just kind of launched it up as a prayer. Cronkite came down with it, but it was a, you know, 50-50 ball. It looks like South Carolina had the interception, but Cronkite actually catches it and scores a touchdown. Throwing that never should have been made. He had another receiver, I think it was Callaway, who was wide open. You know, that read should have been easy. And there was a lot of other times in the game where he just missed the wide open read. But, uh, you know, like you said, uh, they did make him stay in the pocket a little bit more. Um, but – he misread his pocket a little bit too. So at, at one point, I think it was a third down. It was very important. And he moves back in the pocket, runs into a sack. Other times he rolls left, rolls right, right, right into pressure. But, you know, it's still him just learning Michael Wayne's system. And there was a hint a little bit yesterday of uh, maybe some design runs for Treon. But like I said, it wasn't a lot. Um, they're probably not going to do, do it a lot until they absolutely really need it. I do look for it, you know, with FSU and, and Alabama coming up. I do look for more design runs. But, uh, no, he had a really, really bad interception in the end zone. Uh, Florida was about to score, really, really put the game away. And Thursday, right, you know, I have no idea where he was throwing the ball. It was, it, it was either a really bad throw or a really bad read. Either way, it wasn't good. So uh, that was, you know, would have definitely put the game away. Uh, and, uh, I think him or Real Greer, what has been their best friends is getting the tight ends the ball, whether it be Jake McGee or DeAndre Goolsby. When they get those guys the ball, the yards after the catch has been crazy, and it's been converting third downs, very important plays for Florida. I think what we need to do, what Florida needs to do, is try and definitely get Jake McGee and DeAndre Goolsby, maybe even Seante Lewis if he gets back in the rotation a little bit more. Get those tight ends the ball more, because it seems to be whoever was the quarterback, that seems to be their best friend. David Waters from Gator Sports Radio helping us break down the Gators who have wrapped up the SEC Eastern Division Championship in style. So they won it the week prior, but of course wanted to finish it off uh, with only a one-loss campaign uh, to LSU and Death Valley. And, and there's more work to be done, David. So my question here is, I heard some comments made yesterday about uh, maybe Florida wouldn't be up for this game. Maybe they wouldn't. Uh, maybe they would uh, take a week off. They've already accomplished what they need to accomplish. They're going to the SEC championship game. You know, if this team had three losses, I could understand that mentality. But uh, I understand the college football playoff. They've got to get through two of the best teams in the country to get there. And that's something they can't focus on. But in terms of what's in front of them, that's what's in front of them. If you win the SEC, especially if you only have one loss, you're going to the college football playoff. So they still have bigger fish to fry because now they've taken care of the division. So uh, I, I don't understand necessarily those comments. I don't know what the players in McIlwain are talking about at this point, but, um, you know, they can dream big. Right. I think, you know, probably some of that comes from, look, who imagined Florida being in this position when the season started? And, you know, but it doesn't matter. This is the University of Florida. This is a, you know, a purebred blue blood right now, you know, of a college football program who doesn't take losing very lightly. Uh, you're right. And, you know, these, they should have rolled into South Carolina, you know, wanting to win that game. You know, and, you know, as far as McElwain goes, he's pretty much instilled in this team, you know, look, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. We are, you're, you are already further ahead, but there's a, there's a lot more to go, you know, and you're learning every week. You know, you're taking this new staff and, and learning every week. And, no, and they're nowhere near, you know, yes, they're a top 10 team. But, you know, they're not playing. They, they have a, a, lot of, a, a lot of room to grow and to get one of these top four spots. Dude, like you said, they have Florida State and Alabama coming up. The defensive side of the ball can help, you know, take half of that game away. It's going to have to be let this offense grow. But as you said, you know, Florida swept the SEC East yesterday. You know, who – Georgia was picked. Florida was picked fifth. Uh, Tennessee, you know, people thought they would rise up. Florida beats them. You know, to go in there and win the SEC East um, in, in McElwain's first season, it really speaks volume. You know, yeah, the SEC may be down as a whole, but you can still look at it that you know nobody expected Florida to be here. No matter how bad they thought, they, they thought Florida would be part of the problem, and they're not. So you know, it, 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 and it's going to be nice to see you know how how McElwain can turn this. You know, I'm sure recruits are definitely taking notice. 
you know, and, and what happens, you know, with Florida Atlantic coming up, can this offense grow a little bit more and definitely take the next step and get ready for FSU and Alabama? So let's see, they're nine and one right now, right? Correct. Nine and one. Yeah, nine and one. So let's say they lose to Florida State, Bama, and they're going to play a really, really good team regardless in a bowl game. So let's say they lose all three of those games. Yeah, I would still consider it a very successful season for Florida. But standing at nine and one, I just couldn't believe the comments I was hearing that they really could take a week off like it was a, a baseball pennant race and they had a 10 game lead or something. They still have a college football playoff situation here and they're very much uh, have it right in front of them. So I, I didn't uh, quite understand uh, that perspective, but um, good stuff right. for the Florida Gators here. Anything else you would like to see before Florida state hits town? And, well, uh, and, and to hit back on the point we were just kind of hitting on, you know, look at the teams around Florida that lost. You know, and so really what's happening is, you know, Florida, yeah, while it may not be pretty, Florida is still winning its games, you know, and it, more kind of like a, a, you know, Michigan State earlier this year, you know, whether it didn't matter, they were finding ways to win. And right now, and you said it earlier, it's surviving in advance. It may not be pretty, but you're still setting yourself up for that big run. Uh, but yeah, as far as going forward, you know, it's going to be uh, nice to see for Florida, you know, you hate to say in college football, maybe get a little breather, but, you know, the game against Florida Atlantic is, you know, a breather. Like I said, Alex McAllister was injured in the South Carolina game this past week. And, you know, maybe now he can just take this game off and, you know, focus on FSU a little bit. And you don't have to really, you know, pressure him into going out there and performing as much, getting the younger guys like C.C. Jefferson some more playing time. Uh, and, you know, you got these young running backs like Jordan Scarlett and Jordan Cronkite that, you know, could probably use more carries as Taylor has been the workhorse so far. And Treon Harris still needs to grow in this offense. You know, they're still – you know, like I said, he can sit in the locker room this week or sit in the film room, you know, and look at all these misreads he's had and maybe grow a little bit. But, it's, you know, it, it is going to be a game where Florida's another noon kickoff. So, you know, and against a way inferior opponents, so, you know, the crowd environment probably won't be there. But it's still another chance for Florida to grow as a team. Good stuff from David Waters. Uh, Gator Sports Radio joins us uh, just about every Sunday to break down uh, the previous game and look ahead. And it's exciting stuff at this point uh, for the 9-1 Gators. Thanks, David. Appreciate it. Thanks, Mark.